Hello, hello. Uh, I just want to give you a very, very short uh, introduction to some of this material in, uh, in this chapter, uh, chapter seven of the Interpretive Research Design textbook with uh, Devoriano and Peregrine Schwartz Shea. And, and again, you may have a different interpretation of some of this material, but it's meant to just kind of tell you what it is they're up to. Um, for one thing, they start off with, uh, in interpretive research, you know, bringing the humanity into research. And one way to do that is to talk about the human body. And, and uh, the first thing that they discuss is that, you know, they, they kind of take as a, a kind of necessary precondition for talking about people who research is, is the fact that they are people with the same inherent kind of um, differences uh, as, as any people. So you are, um, you are really doing the reader and the scientific community a disservice when you don't discuss the physical kind of limitations uh, physical, intellectual background, you know, not only limitations, but also just physical differences between the researcher and, uh, and the world and, and the population that she wishes to research. Uh, you know, and you, if you're talking about, so, so the first thing they discuss is disability. Uh, and so the wheelchairedness, for example, of a researcher, uh, or the you know, any other disability that may or may not present as visible. And, and uh, the fact that all of that can be accounted for in the research design, but must in order to maintain, you know, um, a proper reflexivity, uh, as well as a, a kind of disclosure to the reader about the positionality of the, uh, of the researcher. So it might be that, you know, the, so in one example, they cite, uh, you can actually enrich the research because there's, a, there's a, an interview that must take place. And in that interview, there, there has to be someone who is, um, who, who is sort of not translating, but projecting some of, the, um, some of the questions to the person being interviewed. And, and that person, who's doing the projecting has to be sort of not making eye contact or within view of the person who is speaking to the researcher. Um, so, you know, that's just this one example of how, you know, you can actually talk about how difficult it was and how, not just how difficult it was, but the prisms, all the prisms that you see this information through uh, can, can become slightly different for really every re researcher that comes down the pike. Uh, and, and it shouldn't be seen as a limitation of research. It should be seen as, you know, just an, uh, an openness and, and, and really, a, hopefully, um, in, in the best case, it can be seen as a way to make people aware through research about the capabilities of, of people who may present as disabled. Uh, and who may be either in a wheelchair or maybe sightless or may, may be deaf um, or, or, you know, or any, any number of other physical differences that, that may present as, as something of an obstacle to be able to conduct any sort of uh, anything resembling what we would think of as ethnographic research. Um, now, certainly covert ethnographic research would be much more difficult. Um, but at least overt ethnographic research where there's a lot of interviewing and a lot of participant observation there's no reason why it can't be accounted for unless, you know, there's no inherent reason why it can't be accounted for and, and take place anyway. But it might require more funding. It might require, it well, certainly will require more time and planning and it will require just uh, maybe different kinds of resources as well as, you know, an enhanced uh, capability of the researcher to make all of those um, concerns reflexive and, and evident and present uh, in the field notes and in the final analysis. So that's one way is so through the through you know the disability lens and the other way is through sexuality and and um, that they, they discuss and they said only now and they were writing in 2012 um, so not too long ago but you know almost 10 years um, but they said even now uh, it's just starting to become 
permissible to even discuss the history of researchers becoming uh, romantically involved and sometimes marrying, you know, people who acted as their informants or participants in the research they were doing for, you know, six months, 18 months, a couple of years. Um, and so, you know, and how that might affect their positionality. Now, a qualitative researcher might say, I'm sorry, a positivist kind of researcher might say, well, you're just bringing too much bias in. But if, if uh, in ethnography, there, it, it would seem that, that in interpretive research, there is certainly at least more room, if not, you know, a definitive break. But certainly there's more room to talk about how, you know, this relationship may have just grown organically somehow through the, the, the research itself. And, you know, they would have been portraying this community somewhat sympathetically or in the same way regardless. But, you know, if you know that there is some kind of romantic entanglement, then, you know, that, that might just allow the reader to make that judgment about whether these, you know, volumes of field notes that have been taken into analysis are somehow compromised, you know, by the fact that they, you know, their, their boyfriend or girlfriend happens to be in that same community. Um, whereas the researcher really was in that community for quite a long time. They were, you know, um, socially distant, but still, you know, um, very, very welcomed and recognized within the community. So, um, so sexuality itself, as well as, you know, the, the status of L LGBTQ um, and, you know, queer and questioning folks. And so um, being able to participate in a, in a way that, that allows um, for... Um, that allows for not just politeness, but, but accuracy in the taking of field notes so that, so that they're not feeling, you know, persecuted uh, or singled out in some way within the research. Um, and, if, and if they are, then, you know, bringing that to bear within the research, um, if, there's, if there's some kind of hostile environment that takes place there or a welcoming environment, you know, it's just it, the researcher becomes maybe more seen and more visible through their research because they are depicting, they perhaps have an opportunity to depict the lens through which they were viewed uh, while they were viewing these, these people that they were immersed in the community of. So all of these issues are, are just, you know, ripe for development uh, within not only field notes, but in the final kind of analysis of, of, of doing ethnographic work. Um, human subjects protections, uh, is, is uh, and again, this is part of the, the humanity, you know, piece of this. Um, human subject protections are, are what uh, inter institutional review boards do. Uh, they are there in the modern era in the United States, uh, ostensibly to protect people from the um, historically, um, you know, I'll say, definitely in the case of the Nazis, but beyond that, there's, there's definitely some ongoing scholarly debate about just how irresponsible um, Milgrams and Bardo and Humphreys really were. Uh, and Pacharat seems to take issue uh, definitely in Among Wolves with, with all three of those characterizations, uh, but mostly going off of this, uh, this kind of, um, this book uh, and its characterizations of, of Milgram uh, and Zimbardo and Humphreys. So obviously Mengele is the Nazi doctor who performed, um, you know, just grotesque and, and, and horrendous experiments on people, all in the name supposedly of research, you know, without regard to the amount of cruelty and pain that he was putting people through because he didn't see them as human beings, right? Um, and that's deplorable. And of course there needs to be, like, everything needs to be done to, to protect people against that. Um, but Milgram, Zimbardo, and Humphreys did not set out to, nor did they actually cause actual, any, any actual physical harm in anyone. Um, uh, and, well, Zimbardo maybe. Um, Milgram, Milgram uh, performed this, um, this experiment that has been, you know, depicted in many places, but uh, I believe I, I spoke about this during the Pachara reading. Um, but just a, just a quick review of, you know, Milgram was... Uh, uh, testing whether people would go through with uh, electroshocking, people would go through with electroshocking other people if they were told by the people in the white coats uh, that they that it was okay, uh, if, how much they respected authority and would, would obey authority 
you know, and if they, and which again was sort of a callback to, you know, how did, how did uh, the Holocaust take place, right? Like that, was a, so how did the people just uh, respected the people in authority and just did whatever they said? Uh, and so just following orders, that whole thing. Um, Zimbardo was, was a little different. It was, it was more probably again, uh, hearkening back. This is of this generation in the sixties and seventies. Uh, but Zimbardo was, was, um, you know, he put people together who were not actual prison guards and prisoners, but made them dress up as prison guards and prisoners and had a simulated prison and then just said, okay, uh, we're going to tell the guards to keep order and we're going to tell the prisoners to just you know behave and they'll get paid in two weeks uh and of course you know all of these social relationships were replicated right that in of uh of, of guards and prisoners and and um you know i i don't i don't think anyone actually got hurt um but there were there were certainly some high stress moments uh during the and, and if and if i'm wrong about that you know forgive me i'll, I'll look it up after after i'm done here um, but Humphreys was more of, um, he didn't actually out anyone, but he did, um, this is in his tea room trade book, uh, where, where he, you know, he stood as a lookout for, you know, men having sex with other men in, in restrooms. And he, you know, recorded some of that, that information. He recorded the license plates of the people, uh, engaged in that. And he would go and he later on, uh, tracked those people down and then went to their door um, pretending that they had never met before and you know the people at home didn't know that they'd ever met this person before he was um, posing as a survey researcher so anyway but he would go and ask them questions about their lives under the guise of a survey but really he was only surveying those people uh, who he had act as, acted as a lookout for but they didn't know that so he didn't you know, he didn't out any of these people in his research, but, you know, when, when his colleagues found out in his department what he had done, they asked him to, they requested that the university that had granted him a PhD to remove his PhD. So people have strong feelings about these kind of um, research practices when you, when you go back and, uh, yeah, when, when you kind of tell them what they are and then, and then, you know, people have visceral reactions to what these kind of extreme circumstances are. But, you know, the argument of, of some interpretivists, I think, including Yano and, and Schwartz Shea, is that, um, you know, these, these uh, are not really representative of modern social science. And in fact, they were, um, they were mostly natural scientists, and, um, what, with the exception of Humphrey, who was a sociologist. You know, none of them were, were political scientists, certainly. Um, and Milgram was a psychologist. I believe Zimbardo was also a psychologist. Um, so which sometimes gets lumped in with social science, but really is it considers itself in many ways a natural science. So, so IRBs uh, have, have crafted these human subjects protections uh, policies that um, everyone must, in order to get approval for their human subjects research, including about teaching and learning, by the way, um, have to go through. So, um, do they, are, you know, do they merit the kind of protections there are? Like, for example, if you don't, um, so the IRB is, is mostly drawn up by not really ethicists, but, but people who have read the reports that were based on, um, you know, the, the Nuremberg trials and, and some history that I, I you know, can't, can't get, get into right now. Um, but they, they judge scientific merit even when it's not their job, uh, and there's often not uh, a scientist on the panel uh, who is in an institutional review board, um, let alone a social scientist. So the IRB will, and, and IRB is set up differently in every institution, but increasingly they kind of defer to federal guidelines uh, about uh, institutional review boards. And um, sometimes they have to follow all of those rules, sometimes they don't. Um, but often IRBs also have an ethnocentric bias. Um, they talk about, in one instance, uh, that uh, people had to write out their questionnaire uh, or their um, their disclosure that that all of you, you know, were had to had to see. You had to see my disclosure about doing research about teaching research methods. 
research about teaching research methods. Um, you know, that disclosure form that I gave you at the beginning of the course, um, that same equivalent, uh, this person needed a disclosure form for their um, indigenous population that did not speak English, uh, and yet issue is required to write it in English, uh, and only so that um, she could show it to the Institutional Review Board and say, oh, we checked that box. Um, so, in, so instead of the so what they call the dynamism and flexibility of ethnography and interpretive research, uh, there are all these rules and suppositions, and I can show you if you're curious, um, if anybody wants to see it, I can show you my, my um, uh, I think I'm ethically allowed, I'm pretty sure I am, uh, to show you my, the questionnaire that you have to fill out uh, for getting IRB approval, and it's like 20 pages long. Um, and and um, you know, I can show you the kind of questions they asked and how I answered them, by the way. You know, it's not a, it's not a secret. That's part of the idea, is transparency. Um, but, but segueing from that, you know, there's this idea now that uh, with the age of the internet and the age of unlimited storage of information, that you should be able to archive all your data. And there are some journals now, and this is a big deal. I know no, nobody watching this right now thinks this is a big deal, but all of your professors, all of them, have had to do some kind of work that has deemed has been deemed appropriate at some point for publication. And in the social sciences and the natural sciences too, I think, when we talk about publication, we're talking about publishing in peer-reviewed journals, okay? And these peer-reviewed journals are the lifeblood of, of uh, the tenure process, uh, which is what, you know, all of your professors are, are engaged in trying to, you know, get at uh, and, and, and get. So, for example, in political science, uh, in, in, you know, universities like, uh, like mid-sized state universities and larger state universities, you have to have three or four or five publications uh, in peer-reviewed journals. And this, the process of writing and approving takes about a year and a half. You have to have two or three or four or five, whatever the number is, uh, it depends on the university, uh, publications in six years. Okay, so you have to get these journals, these journal articles published in six years. And, and some journals are now requiring that you have to have all of your data transparent and archived um, in order to be able to be published in that journal. And there are several political science journals who have done this already. And, and um, you know, and Schwarze say that, you know, field notes are really something that's a whole wrench that's thrown in that. So field notes themselves really can't be archived because a lot of them are confidential. And in Europe, contrary to our practices in Europe, they, they even say that they um, should destroy their field notes after three years, uh, which is what Alice Goffman did after On the Run. Um, so instead of actually protecting people um, with all this transparency, there is some risk of exposure of confidential information. So field notes, um, so, so needless to say, not every journal has, has opted for this, but this is an ongoing and developing controversy even within qualitative political science. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of room for for sympathy about transparency, and, and certainly I sympathize with the idea of wanting to keep everything transparent. Um, and Yano and Schwarze, you know, say the same thing. Um, but there, there is just a lot of power right now um, centered around IRBs, and IRBs, you know, can make or break someone's ability to do a research project. And the fact that they are not really run according to the same principles for optimal uh, social science and and have kind of a straw man or boogeyman of of this kind of mad social scientist uh, that is out to hurt people is is unfair uh, and inaccurate right so so it, so I think that's the big issue that they have um, but you know there are the facts and we have to and they're in many cases the law and the rules so we have to live by them um, so the Oh, and the last thing is, in, in constructing a, um, it's pretty helpful if you look at the end of this chapter, if they talk about the traditional uh, structure of a research paper or an article or a book, 
um, where the first chapter is the uh, literature review and the second chapter is the method uh, and then the data collection. And after that is really the body of your argument and then your kind of conclusion. Sometimes your, your appendix is your, your, your data. Um, and they say that, you know, they'd rather not do, and Yano and Schwarzschild kind of make a point that it shouldn't always be that way. And, you know, there's all these kind of tiny signals that say that you're coloring within the lines. And uh, if you're a qualitative researcher, you're, you're um, um, you know, if you're a qualitative researcher, that, that if there are tables where you can kind of control, like, table like this, you know. Right, so if you can make a table like that, that that uh, that signals that there is some theory that's being tested, and there's categories that are pre-baked in uh, to the theory being tested in the data collection you've done. Uh, but interpretive researchers tend to do other kind of signaling, like they're they're including a lot of reflexivity. They're talking about their own positionality. They're they're talking about the hermeneutics, the communication between. Um, the researcher and the researched, uh, and the researcher and themselves and their notes and the hermeneutics between them and the reader. Those kind of kind, those kind of um, you know, song and dance vocabulary that that interpretive researchers uh, consider to be more their bread and butter. So anyway, that's that's kind of uh, how Yano and Schwarzschild have have sort of a critique right now of how we see research, how we see. Uh, social science and how we've given a lot of power in social science to uh, IRBs and journals that don't always have the same values that the researcher is working with, um, and so it's so in some ways there is a, there's a lot of challenge in the field right now between interpretive researchers and 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 traditional political science research, and um, I hope you will consider some of that when you are are writing uh, your your reaction piece, your literature review to all of this. Uh, otherwise, let me know if you have any questions, and thanks for watching.